Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our last session of Jonah. I hope you all caught from the Boston News last week that there was a man who was swallowed by a humpback whale and was spit out alive. The uh, link is on our church Facebook page if you are looking for it. I just thought you all might find that kind of interesting given our discussion from a couple of weeks ago. This is our last session, and then we are going to take the month of July off, and we will come back in August. And we will be doing a study on claiming the power of the Holy Spirit to make us more like God intended and to be more like Jesus each and every day. Um, the study is called Perfect Love. If you want to know the name of the book or where to get it or how to get it, and you want to leave me a note um, down below in the comments section, I will get back to you and let you know where it is and how to get it. So uh, with that, we were going to let Dr. Richter go ahead and share with us the last session. Hey everyone, welcome to our last session together, The Epic of Eden, Jonah. When we left our last session, we were entering chapter four, and I had entitled it A Compassionate God and a Very Angry Prophet. Because of course, Jonah has actually succeeded. He has succeeded in converting the Ninevites. They've heard his preaching. They've repented in sackcloth and ashes. They've gone into a fast that they've even pulled their sheep and goats and cattle in. How much more excited could he possibly be? But as we have seen, Jonah isn't excited at all. Instead, Jonah was very displeased, according to verse 1, with a great displeasure, and he became angry. And he prayed to Yahweh and said, Please, Yahweh, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, anticipating this, I fled to Tarshish. Because I knew that you are a God of grace and compassion, slow to anger, and abundant loving kindness, and one who repents of evil. So now, O Yahweh, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. This is a full-blown, three-year-old, aka 17-year-old, tantrum, as far as I can tell. Now, I want to start off this discussion about Jonah's displeasure. Uh, pointing out the fact that the word evil is actually used over and over again, not only about Jonah's displeasure, but about multiple other parts in the story. And when we closed down our last session, I was talking about evil and about the fact that Jonah wasn't able to see beyond his own limits, his own comfort zone, to reach into the lives of others. And I want to make sure that I say right here, right up at the beginning, that the complexities of evil in our world truly are complex. And our story of Jonah only addresses one small part of that question. Here we have a holy man who specifically is called to bring the gospel, to bring the good news of Yahweh's redemption to a particular people who he rightfully fears, and maybe not as rightfully, or maybe so, despises. And he is going to be called to stretch beyond that comfort zone. I don't want our audience thinking that that is always the profile of evil. There are situations in our very complex world where we need to stay away from certain evils. Evil is complex. So please don't be entering this session thinking that every single time you have an enemy in the world, you have to extend relationship to them. This is a particular story. I would never want the abused wife to think that she needs to stay in a marriage where she's being beaten in the name of respecting Christian marriage. My heart breaks over the true story of a young Wheaton student who didn't want to profile a carload of ne'er-do-wells and actually wound up abducted and nearly dead because of his kindness. So keep in mind, evil is complex and we have to have a sophisticated response to it. But in this particular story, we've definitely got someone who's a believer who can't reach outside his comfort zone. So let's dive into that. 
Um, Jonah is speaking of his displeasure, his great displeasure, and his sense that evil is not being rectified. Now, interesting to me is the fact that the word evil actually shows up all over the book of Jonah. In Hebrew, it's the word ra'ah. And in Jonah 1, verse 2, right off the bat, Jonah is called to go to Nineveh because their ra'ah, it's translated in most of your Bibles, their wickedness has come up before me. In Jonah 1, verses 7 and 8, the sailors cry out and say, why has this ra'ah, which is typically translated this calamity, this tragedy, come upon us? Do you know, Jonah, where this ra'ah is coming from? In Jonah 3, verse 7, God calls the Ninevites to repent of the ra'ah that is in their hands. And in 3.10, it says that God then relented concerning the ra'ah, which he had declared that he would bring upon the Ninevites because of their repentance. So this is interesting. We've got all sorts of different types of evil scattering across this book. And when we get to chapter 4, which is our focus today, we have a sort of shift of view because ra'ah is no longer sin and storms and violence. Ra'ah is actually the posture of our prophets. And so it says in chapter 4, verse 1, and it was ra'ah to Jonah. It was evil to Jonah. Very ra'ah because these people had repented. There's a problem here. And I honestly think from a literary perspective that one of the things that our narrator is doing in telling us the story of Jonah is that our narrator is juxtaposing all the things that we would readily recognize as evil against Jonah's evil. An evil that we might write off in some of our contexts as holiness. A ra'ah that we might write off as an appropriate bias. And God is taking his servant and he's stretching him. And can I just say, as someone who has spent decades in the Christian community, as a, a, a congregant, as someone in ministry, as a professor of pastors and a professor of undergraduates, when we, the people of God, allow ra'ah in our midst to go unchecked, it is the most dangerous and the most corrupting and the most injurious type of ra'ah out there. Because when we allow ra'ah to exist within the church and we don't confront it, we leave our congregants in a place where the only way they can define ra'ah is as holiness. Because aren't we the church? And so if we don't deal with it, folks, we are condemning the next generation to a type of faith that cannot save. Uh, a faith that is stripped of its power and a religion that is stripped of its transformative energy. Okay, here we are in chapter four and we are very concerned with how Jonah is viewing Ra'ah in this book. And so the Lord says to Jonah, Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry? Now, I have no idea how God actually spoke this to him. Did he stir it in his heart? You know, that moment in prayer where you're sitting there and a thought comes into your head that you know is not yours and the Holy Spirit is kind of doing the thing on the side of your head? Or while he's sitting out there on the east side of Nineveh underneath a nice little shelter with that little vine growing up on top, that God actually rumbles from heaven? I don't know. But either way, Jonah is confronted and he's confronted with his crummy attitude. So Jonah went out from the city and he sat down east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and he sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. And as we said last session, this kind of reminds me of um, a guy in his recliner. You know, he's got the remote control right here. He's got a nice tray of nachos. He's clicking on CNN and he's hoping something's going to blow up. This is our holy man. So the Lord God appointed a perhaps castor oil plant, it's debated, and it grew up over Jonah's little shade structure to be an extra shade over his head. And again, if you come from one of those places where desert is normative, 
gosh, these little vines make such a difference. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. In fact, this verse specifies that the plant grew up to deliver Jonah from Ra'ah, the discomfort of the heat on his head. Poor Jonah, he has heat on his head. He didn't bring his 32 sunblock. There are 120,000 people who are about to die, but he's hot. Hmm. Okay, so Jonah was very happy about the plant. Then God appointed, we're still in that appointment theme, a worm. When dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. And so it was when the sun came in its strength that God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun attacked on Jonah's head so that he became faint. And he begged his soul to die, saying, indeed, death is better to me than life. So we've had the ra'ah of the sun, and God has been kind and given the vine. And then God said, okay, does that feel good? Now, let me appoint the worm. Oh, shoot, your vine is gone. Now, let me appoint the wind. Hmm, hot, uncomfortable, having a rough time. And Jonah, our holy man, who is not traveling in his sweet little cruise ship or sitting in his four-star hotel room, is having a rough time at this point in time. And he cries out that death would be better to me than life. And so God speaks to Jonah again. Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? Now, the first question is, do you have good reason to be angry? Because Nineveh repented. And now the second question is, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, I have very good reason to be angry, even to death. And then Yahweh said, you had compassion on the plants for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow and which came up overnight and perished overnight. Do you see where he always going here? And he goes on to say, if you were angry about the Ninevites converting so that they did not have to die, and you were angry because a vine that you did not cause to grow has perished overnight. Verse 11, last verse of the book. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 human beings? And I find it interesting that the narrator chooses the word Adam, which is the word used of humanity in creation. These are not Israelites. These are not Jonah's kin, but they are the offspring of Adam. 120,000 human beings, Adam, who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. What does it mean not to know the right hand from the left? It means these people do not yet know the character of Yahweh. It means these people have never heard Mosaic law. It means these people are living the only way they know how. These people are living like heathen because, hey, guess what? They're heathen. And these people need to hear from the spokesman of a, the Almighty what it looks like to behave like a citizen of the kingdom of God. Abrupt end. This is the end of your book. Isn't this a very strange end to your book? Don't you kind of feel like uh, should there be chapter five of the book of Jonah or shouldn't there be another paragraph? Well, let me try to bring this book to a conclusion for you. And in a conclusion that I think is shouting at us right here in our faces. We, as we sit at the end of this book and hear about the 120,000 humans that are living in the city of, Jonah, city of Nineveh that Jonah is not concerned about, are sitting here obviously feeling as though the book has ended abruptly and asking the question as regular human beings, how in the world, we ask, could Jonah be more concerned about a castor oil plant than 120,000 people? How in the world could Jonah be more concerned about his personal comfort and the fact that he's getting a sunburn on his receding hairline be more concerned about himself than he is for all of these thousands of people and animals who are occupying the city of Nineveh. 
who repented, who fasted, and who put on sackcloth in order to prove that they meant it. Now, it is absolutely true that sitting in the Iraqi desert in the middle of the afternoon without shade isn't for sissies. But really, Jonah, really, are these equivalent situations? And this is the question that Yahweh is asking his servant. Now, take into context the fact that he has not simply backhanded Jonah and said, you are such a poor excuse for a human being. I am done with you, and I'm going to go hire myself a new prophet. That's not what he's done. Instead, he's questioning Jonah, and he's questioning him because he wants to bring him to a conclusion. And I'm going to argue to you and to me that the reason we've been given this book and the reason that this particular story about the, the official appointed public figure known as Jonah has wound up in our Bibles is that we're supposed to follow along with this line of questioning and we're supposed to be challenged right along with it. In comparison to 120,000 people and 10 times that number in livestock, how in the world could Jonah, a believer, be that self-centered? Okay, now I'm going to start messing. You ready? You might have liked me up until now, and it might change. How could it be that we are more concerned about making sure that our mortgage is paid off and our carpet is clean and we have enough parking spaces for our congregants than we are about the dozens of families who desperately need someone to enter into their lives in relationship and show them what decent parenting looks like, what a family can actually be, and what someone with a job actually looks like as well. How could it be that we are more concerned with our teenagers growing up with the right kids and getting networked into the right school than teaching them to build relationships with real people who really need Jesus and actually helping them to navigate those relationships so that they don't wind up being influenced, but being the influencer. Now, every one of us sitting, listening to this tape right now, including me, is saying, well, of course that's my value system. Well, if it is, does it show? Does it show in the budget of your church? Does it show in the way you delegate and designate ministry and ministers? How about your staffing? Does it show there? Hmm. How could it be that you and I are more concerned with keeping our time slot for worship where it always has been for the last 25 years at 11 o'clock than we are with all of those new families that are moving into town that desperately need a second service and because they've got toddlers at home cannot hope to actually manage to get to church dressed and clean by 845 so that we won't open up a second worship slot for them. Hmm, how can it be that we, the people of God, who are living with the privileges of God, can be so absorbed with our own needs that we can't see the faces of the people around us? Now, guys, I don't live in an ivory tower. I live in a really nice suburb. I'm not going hungry, and my kids go to decent schools. So I am not simply preaching at the choir. I'm preaching at myself as well. But I do know that my teenage daughter had to fight to get her newly converted friend into her small group at church because the other kids and other kids' parents didn't really want that girl in their small group. I do know that I myself have stood on worship committees and said, folks, if we will simply open up this service, I know families that will come. And I've had to argue with the old guard because moving their worship time was just inconceivable. There are a thousand other questions, and I'm actually going to leave you extra time in this presentation so that you and your particular community can talk this through. Are the gifts and the graces that have been offered to the people of God only for the people of God? Or for, are they for the folks of Nineveh as well? 
What I'm challenging us to think about, it's not easy, it's not comfortable, I'm not feeling easy, I'm not feeling comfortable, but it's the gospel all the same. Okay, let's head back to our book just for a moment. Let us remember that Jonah is coming from the small state of Israel. He is placed in the first half of the eighth century where life is pretty safe and pretty comfortable. He is called to go preach to Nineveh, which at this point in time is the other side of the world. Those people don't affect me. It's, it doesn't matter in my personal life what happens to those people over there. We're good. Well, that's up until 745 BC. Because when Tiglath Pileser takes over Nineveh, what used to be the comfortable little state of Israel is going to become the embattled province of Assyria. Hmm. Assyria, Neo Assyria, is going to take over the world. In 734 and 732, Tiglath Pileser III is going to make his first foray into the northern kingdom, and he's going to transform what used to be an independent uh, country into a province, and he's going to slaughter thousands, and he's going to drag off thousands as well as slaves and exiles. In 722 BC, 10 years later, his heir, Shalmaneser the fifth and Sargon the second is involved in this as well, is going to come riding over the Fertile Crescent and they're going to wipe out the northern kingdom. They're going to burn Samaria to the ground and they're going to wipe out tens of thousands. And you know those ten lost tribes you've heard about? This is when and where they're exiled. They will never come home again. In other words, the very Nineveh that Jonah was called to preach to in the first half of the 8th century, if it had been successfully converted and transformed and discipled, this stuff might never have happened. I had a person ask me once, what ha would happen if there was a fifth chapter to the book of Jonah? What would have happened if instead of going home after his preaching, and forgetting about this difficult and uncomfortable assignment that the Lord Holy Spirit had given him, he had grabbed himself 10 Levites and headed back to the land of Nineveh and actually discipled the populace of what will now become in our world, Iraq. What would have happened if instead of leaving them with just a whisper of the gospel, he had actually pulled as many workers as he could over to that far country and transformed them into worshipers of Yahweh. It is quite possible that 732 and 722, and what will happen in the southern kingdom in 701, and you'll learn about that in the Isaiah curriculum, would never have happened. And so what has come into my mind through that question that someone asked me so long ago is people of God, save the Assyrians and save yourself. Let me say that again. Save the Assyrians and save yourself. Let me throw a modern map up on your screen for a moment. And let me show you where the city of Nineveh is. As you look at this map, what you see is right across the river and that river moves. So right across the river is a modern reality is a city named Mosul. Have you heard of it? Well, probably 15 years ago, very few of us had ever heard of Mosul. But as of right now, it's moved into common parlance. We all know where Mosul is, and we all know who is there. And we've all lived through international struggles that have resulted in massive deportations, massive executions, and we have seen on YouTube that those who have been brave enough at this point to be representatives of the gospel have answered the question, do Christians and Muslims worship the same God at the end of a rifle? And if the answer was wrong, well, you've seen the clips. Save the Assyrians and save yourself. Let me end with a letter story and show you a cuter picture here. Um, what you are looking at here in this picture 
is uh, a shot of a young woman named Eden Parker. And I have her permission to show you her sweet little picture. When I first met Eden, she was a 16, almost 17 year old homeschooler who had decided that she wanted to take intermediate Hebrew. Because you know those homeschoolers, they're just over-motivated. And so here I was teaching at Wheaton College, the great granddaddy of all liberal arts Christian colleges, and I've got a small intermediate Hebrew class, and there's this girl sitting in my class who was scared to death and very, very focused. Well, Eden, of course, just killed it all, and she did great, and she got all the way through intermediate Hebrew and earned a fabulous grade, and she earned my respect as well. Well, a year later, when Eden came back and applied to Wheaton College as a student, uh, she got waitlisted. And she got waitlisted largely because of demographics. Um, we tend in crystal liberal arts institutions to have more young women applying than young men. And it wasn't anything having to do with her talent or skill. It was the logistics of who we were admitting. And she gave me a call. And she said, Dr. Richter, I, I didn't get in. And I just wanted to thank you for writing a reference letter for me. And, and I'm sad, but I'll be OK. And I said, Eden, let me see what I can do. And so not because I was like best friends with her family or any of that sort of thing, but because she was a decent kid and she deserved a decent chance, I called the admissions office. And I found the admissions officer. And if you know me well, you know it's hard to say no to me. And after three, four phone calls, we got little Miss Eden Parker admitted as a freshman into Wheaton College, which of course she tore it all up and was a star of our track team and just graduated a year ago. Well, guess what Eden decided to do as a part of her time at Wheaton College? She decided that she wanted to be involved in discipling middle school girls. And guess what I had in my house when Eden Parker was a student at Wheaton College? That would be a middle school girl. And that middle school girl is my firstborn and the light of my life and the other half of my soul. And she had the privilege of those four years of being loved and discipled and having her heart and, and life and world transformed by this fabulous example of a young woman who's only a few years older but had a faith that would rock all of our worlds. Save the Assyrians, save yourself. Get a freshman off the wait list, get your middle schooler disciple. Go to Mosul and see what might happen. So as we come to our conclusions, I do not uh, suppose that I have all of the answers for what the book of Jonah is about or what it's presenting. I have some of them. I don't have all of them. I'm counting on your discussion leaders and your study and the study guides to bring out lots, lots more. But there are a few things that I am very clear on. One of them is remembering that this book is not actually about Nineveh, but about the character of Jonah's God. I see in its message to its ancient audience and to us comes in several parts. First of all, there is a message here that Yahweh is truly the Lord of the cosmos. This is a God who hurls wind, who whistles for whales and they come, who appoints a worm to eat a vine that he had appointed to grow, who can call up the east wind and knows exactly where his servant is at any point in time. Message number two are that God's servants, God's people are in his hand. What does the proverb says? A man make his plans, but God directs the steps. And you think you've got it all set up and all of a sudden you wind up in Santa Barbara, California at Westmont College. Gosh, that wasn't exactly on my radar screen, but oh, am I glad I'm there. God's servants are in his hands. And if he sees the need, God will cast those messengers off of a trade ship. If he sees the need, he will put their lives at risk. But that God is equally able to rescue that servant out of the rolling sea and rescue his life against all odds. Third thing I see here is that the most central message is that Yahweh, the Lord of the cosmos, actually cares about every man, woman, and child on this planet. 
He actually is in pursuit of every son of Adam and every daughter of Eve, regardless of what their history claims, regardless if they're Ninevites, if they belong to the Assyrian Empire, if they have attacked the kingdom of God, if they have threatened its citizens, if they are every inch a problem, he still wants to redeem their souls. And he will not be done until he has offered that redemption to every one of them. What else do I see perhaps most central to this is that that message holds true, even if that son of Adam or that daughter of Eve has lived their life as an enemy of the kingdom of God. God is still willing, able, and eager to send his servants to them. So in sum, to contradict Archibald the asparagus, there has been no mistake. There's been no misunderstanding. The word of God is not just for the people of God. It's for the lost. It's even for the enemies of the kingdom. In the book of Jonah, Jonah is delivered from the consequences of his own sin by the hand of his God. He who willfully, deliberately, and intentionally violated the will of his God is given a second chance. Will Jonah extend the same opportunity to his own enemies? And of course, the word of God that is for the people of God is asking the people of God, will we do the same? Jonah is pretty doggone entitled at the end of the book, it seems to me. And, and God is reaching out for people who have no reason to expect anything at all. I guess we call that grace. Um, when you get something that you have no, no claim to. Which is funny because even in the Old Testament, I would suggest to you that <clears throat> law and covenant are at their heart a, uh, a function of grace. When Moses goes to the top of Mount Sinai and comes back with the covenant, right? What did the Israelites do to deserve it? And the answer is nothing. Absolutely nothing. And what was the purpose of the law and the covenant? Which I give away part of the sermon Sunday, but you all forget by Sunday. You all promise me you'll forget by Sunday. The purpose of the covenant is so that by the end of the book, God can dwell with his people. That's the purpose. That's the gift. And uh, I find it interesting that Joan is entitled. Joan is, Joan is entitled to a, a, a nuclear holocaust. He's, he's, he's out there ready to watch the meteorite strike in and take it down and leave him in town. Because uh, he's, he's done his thing. Somebody's cooking. Or am I just smelling things? I know Blaine said he smelled something when That's he... not burning. That's, that's something somebody cooking. Oh. Know. Well, I'll go across the street and see who's cooking after this. <laughs> that may just be me. I may be going crazy. So, uh, we can we can do this as, as far as you want. We started a little bit last night in the evangelism committee. Uh, knowing that this is where we would have... It is amazing. Um, if I had $5 for every person in every church I have served who felt entitled to a degree on that thermostat, I would be a wealthy man. It just amazes me what people argue what they feel entitled to um, and what we get all huffy about. But I'm not going to go there because I'll be looking for a new job if I, if I walk down that road. So. Um, 